As we prepare to start a new year, it's awesome to first take a moment to reflect on everything that we've accomplished and learned this past year. At Musical U, this is no different, and we've certainly had an amazing year. Today, we'll revisit some of our favorite episodes from 2019 on this special episode of Musicality Now. Hello, and welcome back to a special end-of-the-year episode of Musicality Now. My name is Adam Liette, Director of Operations for Musical U, and I'm so happy to be joined by the other members of the Musical U team for this special look back on the last year of the show. And what a year it's been. Just to recap, we started the year by beginning a new video format and publishing the show on YouTube. We talked with over 30 top music learning experts from a wide variety of backgrounds and disciplines. Beatles Month was our first featured month, and we dove deep into the musicality of the Fab Four with several renowned Beatles experts. And of course, revisited our favorite records and songs from the band while doing it. And in the last part of the year, we unveiled our new Pathways series, where we interview normal, everyday musicians that have unlocked a new musical path with Musical You. If you haven't listened to a Rewind episode before, we'll be playing short sound bites from previous interviews from the course of the year. And then we'll talk about how we are able to use these tips and tricks in our actual musical life. Perhaps you'll hear something that you missed the first time around, or discover someone new that could change everything for you. In any case, we'll link to the full episodes in the show notes at musicalitynow.com. I'm particularly excited by this episode as I begin thinking about new things that I'll be doing in the coming year with my music and my life. Well, I've talked for long enough. Why don't I bring the rest of the team in? Andrew, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Andrew Bishko, and I am the product manager at Musical U. Hi, I'm Anastasia Wojtynskaya, and I'm a content creator and a graphic designer here at Musical U. Hi, I'm Zach Bailey, Z-Sonic on the Musical U side. I'm a community assistant. I'm feeling real good about being here today. Great. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I know I was looking over the list of the clips that you all brought, and there's so much goodness in this episode. I really just want to dive straight into it. So we're going to start off with episode 195 with Josh Turknet, who runs a website called Brain Joe, and he had some really awesome stuff to say. So I think there's enough evidence to uh, indicate that when we learn new things, um, the brain takes that as a signal that we need to keep this apparatus around um, that, that allows us to do this. So um, it sort of keeps that machinery in good working order. Whereas, you know, our brain's not stupid. So if we stop using it, it literally downregulates the, the, all the, you know, the genes of things that were are required to maintain that. And um, that has consequences. Um, it has consequences in our cognitive function, but it also likely has consequences in terms of how protected we are against degeneration and uh, disease. So there's reasons from that perspective. And so the other thing that comes out, if you, un if you take this perspective, is that if you're optimizing for brain health and brain function, then it's actually great to be terrible at something, right? You wanna choose the thing where there's the most ca capacity for growth, right? So this can completely you know, flip on its head how we might typically feel about things. So when, from this perspective, if you're terrible, if there's a huge gap between where you are now and some you know, idealized version you wanna be down the road, that's fantastic because that means there's a tremendous amount of growth that can happen, which will then translate to all these cognitive benefits uh, that you can accrue for it. So that, that clip was really personal to me. Um, we, we've, in the past couple of years, we've had, uh, my, my grandmother has had a degenerative uh, brain capacity and Alzheimer's. And it, it's, it's a reminder to me that we learn music, not just because it's, it's a part of our lives, but it actually is good for us to be learning music and to be learning new things. And I know in this coming year, I'm, I, I have a couple personal and professional challenges from my music life and my business life and just being a dad and all these new things that are happening all the time. And it's a good reminder that it's okay to learn. It's okay to not be the best at something right away. It's okay to be terrible, as Josh said. And by being terrible, it actually gets all those synapses firing and gets your brain working in a new way. And so as I'm constantly being pulled into new directions, just reminding myself that that's okay, that really inspired me as I go planning my goals and the things I'm gonna be doing in the coming year to remind myself, push myself harder, 
and farther than I have in the past. You know, that's so true, Adam. And uh, it's, it's really, it was really reassuring to me that particular episode, that particular quote, I've uh, been a lot more at peace with being terrible at stuff uh, <laughs> lately. Um, and, uh, you know, I was really inspired in terms of my own self-improvement by this next, uh, this next quote. And uh, this is the, the Quaby sisters who are professional musicians and touring musicians is a little bit different than our usual podcast guests. We usually have people that are some have some kind of a toe in the water about education, music education. But in this case, these are uh, pro musicians all the way. And, uh, but their story was really inspiring. It's something we can all learn from. And yes, I don't think that we're musical prodigies or anything. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but, you know, if you, if you enjoy it and you, you like are into something, you can learn almost anything. That's yeah. kind of how I look at it. That helped immensely to already be, have an ear that was sort of trained for harmony you know, mm -hmm. to listen for parts when we went to go to start singing, but uh, we were just, we were terrible. And <laughs> like, I, we, we said to ourselves, we'll sing if we like it and if we sound good. And it, it was really a struggle at first. Neither one of those happened at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia was going to tell a story. I know a story you were going to tell. You can tell. We it. have, because we used to record all of our stuff on tapes, you know, just like tapes and a tape player. Cassettes. And we get those little Sony cassettes. Thank you. That's the word. We have our early singing tapes labeled as wretched singing tape number one. <laughs> Red thing it do. We recorded and it just everything. We recorded everything. So you're hearing right now from a group that's known for their vocals. In fact, that's where first attracted uh, our attention at Musical U. Christopher was uh, a fan of their vocal harmonies. Uh, and so here you have, they went from you know zero to hero on the singing scale. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that I've, I've undertaken myself is learning a new instrument. Uh, you know, I'm pushing 60 pretty soon. And, uh, and I started a new instrument called, it's a Mexican instrument called the Biwela. And, you know, uh, I, I thought it was crazy for doing it. I really wanted to do it. I really, it's something I just wanted to do. And, uh, when I first started it, it took me a while. Like I'd pick it up and I'd like, this is hard. You know, I don't really get this. And then when I started getting into it, I started to just absolutely love it. I love it. I listen for it in music. I love the sound of it. I love doing it. It feels really good. And uh, I've never played a uh, stringed instrument before. So it's, that's a new thing for me. And, you know, I realized, hey, you know, this is not the last instrument I'm going to learn. Uh, because it's such a wonderful process. And if I love it, like they you said right in the beginning, if you love it and you want to do it, you can learn almost anything. Yes, yeah, really nice, really nice uh, clip, Andrew. Um, I love that episode with the Quavy sisters. They are so pleasant and happy. And um, yeah, that, you know, recording yourself when you're terrible and just pushing through it for the love of it, it, it will really take you very far. And I actually think that those recordings, even though they might seem terrible at first when you record them, they might actually lead you to something bigger and better in the future. And that kind of ties in to, to my clip that I chose from Mark Colley, who is um, a very uh, well-established and successful songwriter. So yeah, I, let's go ahead and take a listen to that. You've got, you've got to find the inspiration and you can't wait for it to hit you. So you need tools, not rules, but tools. One of the best ones I ever heard early on was to look for titles. Um, they can be lines, they can be titles, but um, the way to find them, uh, I'll share the value of them, but to begin with, um, what I've done over the years always is take, now it's an iPhone, but it used to be a pad and a pen, and go to a bookstore, walk up and down the aisles endlessly, go to a library, do the same thing, watch TV and movies, same thing. Anytime something caught my eye or my ear, it's on the list. I just keep adding them, adding them, adding them, adding them. Then when I sit down to write, rather than go, okay, I'm here, inspire me, you know, muse, 
I'd go, what do I have on the list? Oh, there's a title. There's an idea. There's something kind of fun. Well, that's the difference to me is to, and that's what Rodney Crowell's alluding to is that it's earned. I earned that inspiration by spending, you know, how would I put it? Um, intentional time. I intentionally went and sought things that might come into play in my songwriting all the time. Yeah, so Mark Colley talks about, you know, finding your inspiration there and, and spending intentional time cultivating ideas and collecting ideas. So for me, I do definitely collect titles, but also other musical ideas, rhythms uh, from people talking or just nature sounds. Any, anything that happens to me in my daily life that, that could be a musical idea, I'll write it down or record it into my phone. And, um, and what I do is I, I think of them as Lego blocks. So when I go into my creative brainstorming sessions, I, I, my creativity comes from how can I put these different ideas together like blocks and, and instead of trying to just come up with ideas. I already have a bunch of ideas and you know, I collect them throughout, throughout my whole life, just like Mark Colley talks about all the time. You know? um, and so that way, when I go into my creative sessions, I don't have to spend any time thinking of, of ideas and I get into my flow state much quicker because I'm just, hey, I have all these ideas. You know, I pick one or two and see how they fit together. Oh, does this lyric go with this rhythm idea? Does this title go with this chord progression? Does it sound like, you know, the mood, the title or whatever? So I just kind of do creative brainstormings where I, where I put these Lego block ideas together that I've been listing out, basically. It could be, you know, text lists or audio recordings. Um, so I'm really excited moving into 2020 because I'm building my repertoire of my own, you know, comp compositions and songs. So this is really going to help me to like just have all these ideas ready to go. And then I jump into my creative sessions and I just, you know, piece these blocks together. It really helps me flow. I really, really love that, Zach, especially your Lego blog analogy. Um, I have a really similar kind of approach to making music, too. And it's so great to have like this catalog of inspiration before you even like sit down to write a piece of music or play or whatever. And um, I love that kind of intentional and deliberate path to inspiration rather than just kind of waiting around for something to hit you. I think that's really great. Um, I think this nicely segues into um, my clip, which is uh, from our episode with Robert Emery, it's episode 204. So, so I believe in, in something that I made up, which is called the, the, the duvet of music or the blanket of music or whatever analogy you want, which is surrounding yourself um, with so much music that you have to fight your body and your mind and your heart and your soul to be able to not have that music penetrate you and, and affect you in a positive way. And I was really seriously lucky that when I was young, at my primary school, we had a dedicated music teacher. Um, we had assembly every morning uh, where we sang every morning. There was a school orchestra that performed pretty much every morning. It wasn't a private school. I didn't come from a wealthy family. This was just a local Church of England school down the road in my little village. I love this duvet analogy, um, and I love duvets, and I think he makes a really great point when he says to surround yourself with music um, until it's quite literally coming out of your ears. And the more you look for opportunities to do this, um, to push the borders of your own musicality uh, by connecting with other musicians, by joining musical communities like the one that we have at Musical U, um, just by engaging with music really in as many different ways as you can, really the better off you'll be, particularly when it comes to music communities, even something as simple as playing with someone else or playing in a band. Um, I found that in my own practice, immersion is just such an effective learning technique that gives you the gift of musical appreciation alongside kind of like all the technical skills and the ear skills and the background that you want. And um, just like he says in the clip, there's just this ultimate positive impact of music. It's just, it's good for the soul. Um, so in this coming year, I'm excited to kind of like immerse myself even further in uh, my music community that exists in my town, for example, um, into just diving into learning more 
history and facts about music, uh, spending more time on forums, including the ones that we have at Musical U. Um, I just know it's going to be really, really, really great for my musicality. I love that idea too. Um, this being wrapped up in music and, and I'm really blessed that I've uh, been able to design my life that way <laughs> in so many ways. I don't know if it was uh, uh, <clears throat> intentional or uh, it, which came first, the music or the duvet, but it's nice and warm and cozy. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the, um, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot this year is there's certain places where I feel like I've achieved uh, plateaus where no matter how much listening I do, no how, how much practicing I do, um, there's certain places where I just wasn't, uh, I wasn't getting the results uh, that I wanted to in my music. And uh, this next clip, uh, Greg Goodhart has helped me tremendously in moving past those. Well, you already learned those. They're not working anymore. It, so they, what happens is, and, and it all is in the communication, how we teach deliberate practice, as we were saying, what happens is, is their teacher taught them a manifestation of the concept of desirable difficulty. They did not teach them about desirable difficulty. So that they gave them a fish and they ate for a day instead of teaching them how to fish so they could eat for a lifetime. And so, yes, it worked because you can bet when they first showed it to these people, it worked spectacularly well. And then what happened? It worked less and less. And now we're right back where we started. How is it you didn't give them the, well, just keep looking for something different to do. And so that's what we do in the practice class. Sometimes I'll, uh, it will be a different situation. Sometimes I'll want them to play it backwards. That works great. Usually after we do dots, we'll play it backwards. And I can usually tell I've gotten it right when someone goes, <gasps> that's what I wanted to do. If it's going to cause you that kind of, of uh, distress, that's what you're looking for. And we just go through whatever variations we need to go through, and you'll watch. They will struggle. I will point it out to the group. Look at them struggle. In fact, I talk about the universal sign of learning. There really is a universal sign of learning. For instance, this. Everyone around the world knows what this is. It means you're choking. It's a, a smile is universal. Everyone knows that means happy everywhere. You don't need language. There is truly, and I'm not joking about this, a universal sign of learning. And you can see in my videos when I point to it happening. It looks like this. The brow furls, the eyes narrow, the lips purse. When someone starts doing that, losing track of their facial expressions and has to focus so hard, then you know you've hit the sweet spot. I call it the international sign of learning. And that is the manifestation of desirable difficulty. Okay, the universal sign of learning. Uh, perhaps I should have uh, given a little more background in the beginning here. Um, he's talking about different this idea of desirable difficulty. And the way to, one of the best ways to get past a plateau in your music is to make things harder. Um, because our brains get bored just doing endless repetitions and they don't really learn all that, um, th that, that stuff that uh, Josh Turknet was talking about where when something's really hard, the, the brain just lights up. When it's just only kind of hard or just repetitions, your brain just shuts down. It's, it's, it's designed to be very efficient. So we want to keep our brain really active. And so making things harder uh, is the best way to make things easier, in a sense. So uh, what he was talking about, this idea, and I had learned these kinds of techniques when I was younger in terms of, you know, you play through a passage with dotted rhythms or with triplets or something like that. But he's saying that a lot of times people learn to do that, but they don't learn what that whole idea behind it is, the idea of desirable difficulty. And if you understand that, it's really fun. You can get really creative about making things harder. Like I said, you know, like one of the things he said, you know, playing something backwards or playing something uh, uh, with a different rhythm or change the rhythm. Or uh, I remember from Mark Gelfo's uh, podcast, uh, he even will do a different emotion. He'll play something with a different emotion. Uh, and he'll change his emotional repertoire, you know, like he'll play something where he's feeling shame. <laughs> Try that, you know, so, uh, or, or, or happiness or joy, you know, but he'll even do the negative emotions where, uh, you know, if these are all different ways to 
get to in, in, engender desirable difficulty. And uh, it's something that I want to be a lot more creative with because it's actually, um, while it's kind of like not fun, it's, you can get creative about it and it becomes fun to do that. It's like, okay, how can I mess with myself today? And, you know, I've learned that I don't have to perfect something when I'm doing that. It's like, I just work on it, work on it. It's like playing something backwards. I don't have to perfect playing it backwards. And then all of a sudden the next day, bam, I can play it a whole lot better. So it's working with these really weird ways in which our brain learns and understanding them, uh, you know, counterintuitive ways in which our brain learns something that is helping me break through some of the plateaus in my music. And I'm really enjoying it. In fact, so much that I've started taking uh, lessons with Greg. Uh, and we also have a master class coming up with him in January. So plug the master class. Um, we'll be seeing more of Greg coming up. He's, he's fantastic. There, there will be a link in the show notes to register to, for the master class. Just go to Greg's interview. So, if if you're watching, if you're watching on YouTube, the 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 link is down there. Uh, yeah, thank you, Andrew. That was a really powerful uh, clip, and I I love Greg's approach and how he he does that. And it reminds me of like making something more difficult than it has to be. For some reason, what sticks out in my mind is I ran my first marathon last year. And I knew it was going to be, it was a very rural marathon, not in a city. And so I would do my training runs, like 10, 12, 14 mile training runs on a track to train my brain to deal with the boredom and to push past that. So that's just like one of those little methods that I had, I had to use in my own training to, you know, become stronger so I could actually do what I had to do. So for my next clip, I, I selected something about practice as well, and it's from a guest we just recently had the show, Jonathan Harnum, and he brings this idea that I never heard of before, and it's called guerrilla practice. So let's hear what Jonathan had to say. Yeah, so uh, guerrilla practice is something that I'm using almost exclusively right now. It's the idea that that you can get things done and you can learn things in just short little chunks, five minutes, two minutes, one minute. Um, and it's a really powerful idea for a couple different reasons. Uh, one is that there's a lot of research that shows um, the more that you recall an idea, let's say I'm working on a, say a, a piano fingering, you know, and I have to do, I don't know, I don't know what it might be. Um, well, when, when I'm sitting in line waiting to, I don't know, get a coffee or whatever, I can practice that finger motion on my leg. You know, maybe I practice it for two or three minutes or less, 30 seconds, maybe two or three run throughs. Um, you know, I'm not at the instrument, but that's not necessarily a, a challenge. You know, it's, that there's nothing wrong with that. You can still practice the motion. So there's, there's lots of times during the day where you can get in short little bursts of practice, whether it's, uh, say, a difficult spot in a melody or remembering lyrics to a tune or, uh, I mean, it could be a million different things. Uh, and just just taking that moment you know, in your car or wherever you are to do this little short burst of practice. And I mean, it all adds up. Cool little concept. And where it appealed to me is I just returned to music. I had an eight year break where I did not play music at all. I was busy doing a different career. And when I came back to music, finally, I wanted to get back into the habit that I was able to have as a professional musician and as a student where I would have practice sessions. We all know what what we mean by that. We're these long two to three hour, you know, expansive practice sessions where I'd have a proper warm up and I'd go through some etudes and then some prepared pieces and some sight reading and just have this like system, this formula I was working in. And I still need to play. I, I need to express myself musically, but I don't have the time to do that anymore. Between professional obligations, family, the community, I mean, if I get an hour away and I try to take it off to practice, it's some my phone's going to ring or something's going to come up on uh, Instant Messenger. It's going to happen. But I do have five minutes. I have five minutes at multiple points throughout the day. And I can find those five minutes. And instead of wasting it on Facebook or watching another YouTube video, I can have my trumpet right next to my desk and pick it up, play a little bit, put it back down, go back to work. Good enough for me. So I, I definitely plan on doing that. And to the point, I'm 
I now keep my trumpet in my office and it's the first thing I take out when I get to the office. I take out my trumpet, put it on its stand, and then I take out my computer. So it's very, very intentional that I'll be doing this in the coming year. Cool. I love that. Um, I think a lot can actually happen in five minutes. And even though it seems like it's no time at all, I think a lot of like flashes and brilliance can happen in those short little time chunks. I know at points when I've been writing a song, I've just like come back to it for maybe five or 10 minutes. And suddenly I'm like, oh, wait, this is a good idea. I can put this in, which is something that just never happens when I'm at it for like two hours and I'm breaking my brain trying to kind of make something happen. So that's, um, that's really solid advice. And uh, my next clip actually deals with um, something tangentially related to this. And it's, uh, it's from an episode called How Composers Improve uh, with Matthew Elo. And it's uh, episode 198. If you compare, and I did this back then, if you compare the first works and the last works by anyone, any known composer, you can see a huge difference that they continued to grow. And so that's what we should aim for, I think, this continuous growth. Not comparing, you know, my level to someone's level or, you know, this work to that work. No, let's just keep learning. Let's keep improving. Let's enjoy the process. And uh, let's hone our skills, just like the greats before us did. Just like the greats before us did. Um, I love that. And I think it's a really necessary reminder that Mozart was not, in fact, born Mozart, and his dad did have to show him where middle C was on the piano. Um, so I think stop comparing is kind of certainly easier said than done, but I do think that it's absolutely essential for music practices, music practice, sorry, and in some cases, you almost have to force yourself to put your blinders on and stop looking to the left and stop looking to the right, um, because when your blinders are on, that's when you're totally focused on your own skills and your own craft. And I think that's when practicing becomes this like totally engrossing, like involved activity. And that's when that's really like when the real magic happens um, in my own practice. I've noticed that really nothing kills inspiration and my enthusiasm and my exploration quite like looking around me to see what and how everyone else is doing and drawing comparisons to myself. It's just like the easiest way to kill my mood and make me want to put down my instrument, which is such a shame. Um, and increasingly I found that conversely my best practice, my best work, my best flashes of inspiration come to me when I'm not thinking about anybody else, but instead I'm fully and totally focused on my own art. How really, really beautiful on stage. I really, I agree with that. I've had some same experiences. You got to really just put those blinders on and get in your zone. I, that's really awesome. And about Mozart, uh, that ties into Robert Emery because Mozart definitely had a duvet of music. He was definitely music all the time. So that, that that's, that's saying something there. I think that really helped him become Mozart. But yeah, just just getting in your zone and, and, and yeah, and working on you and not worrying about anyone else. That really ties in well to uh, the clip I, I chose here from Susanna Ulbrich, who specializes in mindful music practice. And so let's go ahead and listen to that. It's a very receptive approach. I guess in our culture, we have a very go-getting approach. So even in music practice, there can be a lot of striving to get this right, to improve our technique and to get better gigs. And um, in mindfulness, for example, we also talk about non-striving to come from a place of letting things come to you. Sounds pretty revolutionary, doesn't it? <laughs> in our culture. And deep listening has a strong emphasis on rest being receptive to really sit and listen and see what becoming curious of what's happening there are so many sounds that go unnoticed um, and then there are also listening to your own creative impulses there are so many creative impulses that go unnoticed just because we're busy with the next email with the next phone call 
I really love this episode with Susanna and uh, there's so much I could say about just that one little clip. So I'm going to try to like hold myself back from just like this, this, that whole idea of just being receptive really changed my life and helped me find a lot more ease and a lot more flow. And like when I'm in my creative zone, if I'm just being receptive and aware to the things that are happening in my body and with the sounds, then I, I naturally am not even going to have brain power to even think about what other people are doing because I'm just so focused on just being receptive. And this really led me to uh, kind of a golden rule that I've been using in my musical practice. I actually wrote it, uh, there's a little note right here. You probably can't read it, but it says, don't try too hard. Don't try too hard. Don't, don't strive too much. It says, don't try too hard. And so when I go into my creative uh, brainstorming sessions, when I'm putting those Lego blocks together, I don't try too hard. Um, and I, and I, I'd be receptive. And I, and I try to notice when I start trying to, or when I start trying too hard to do a certain technique, or I start trying too hard to do a certain music theory, or I start thinking about what people are going to think of this performance. I, I'm trying hard to impress someone that's not even in the room. And then I start noticing what happens with my mind and my body when, when I start trying too hard. And then I notice how that affects the music that I'm practicing and playing. And then I notice how that change in the music starts affecting my mind and body again. And so it's just a cycle. And the more I become receptive and aware of what's happening in my practice, the more relaxed I become, the more focused I become, and the more things just start happening easily. And like, I feel like I'm just getting started with this since I heard that interview. And I'm really excited to see what the, the next year of just being receptive has in store for me and my creativity. Yeah, tremendous. I look forward to being there with you, Zach. Uh, we look forward to getting uh, some recordings from you again. Zach has these most amazing recordings. You find him on Instagram. He's got some really cool stuff out there. So one thing that we really like to do at Musical U is talk about uh, light bulb or aha moments. And I know just listening to the rest of the clips and, and talking with the rest of you, I had a couple aha moments myself. So I just kind of want to open up the floor and, and let everyone talk about what they're walking away from this episode with. And me personally, uh, Mark Cauley, his episode, it, it, it made me realize that I need to be constantly searching and constantly working towards some of the professional goals I have. And when he talks about gathering song titles for years and years and years, there's a, there's a story of James Hetfield from Metallica, how he had this book of like song titles and people like enter Sandman. What's that? He had that song title for about a decade before he actually wrote the song. And now it's arguably the biggest hard rock song in the history of hard rock. But the song title was written way before the song was. And so how can I do that in my own life? And it's great because we have all these like tools now, right? These, these, these devices where you can just put anything on and just plop it into Evernote or whatever other doc you're using. And it's there. It'll be there forever. And so I, I'm going to make a more conscious, e e conscious effort to be gathering, always searching, always looking for the next inspirational moment in my life. I love that you said tools right there, because in that Mark Colley episode, he said you need tools, not rules, because tools is what helps you facilitate creativity. And then I was also thinking about the, the clip you chose um, about the, the gorilla practicing. And, and when I was thinking about that while you were playing a clip, that's really very freeing. Because if you hold yourself to this idea, I need to practice however much time, two hours, 10 hours to be whatever, it's kind of stresses you out and it's limiting you. And this idea of you can get better in a short amount of time is very freeing. And then you start finding all these times. And actually it ties into the Mark Holly episode because in that episode, he says, if you're a beginner, then maybe spend a shorter amount of time that's more focused. And Greg Goodhart also talks about how when you're doing this focused practice, and making this stuff challenging for you, you can't really do it that long, when, especially when you first start. So I think this guerrilla practice and these things, it really not only does it help you find more practice time in your day, but it could be the best way for you to practice depending on what you're trying to achieve and, and where you're at. You might only need to practice five, 10, 15 minutes, and, and that might be great for you. I think that's very freeing. My biggest aha moment in this episode was that we started out with this idea that we didn't have a set theme. We were just going to look at the podcast of the past year and what inspired us. But look at the themes that are coming out and uh, and how all these tie together. You know, when you hit, when you started 
in each episode when it came up, it's like, oh yeah, there's that. Oh yeah, there's that. And you know, just to add to what you're just saying about uh, guerrilla practice, when we focus our attention for a short amount of time, we could really focus on being receptive and on being mindful and thinking about what we're doing. You know, that's part of the work that I've been doing with Greg is I'm really thinking very deeply about what it means like to move from one chord to the next or, or move uh, or, or all the little details and nuances of something that I'm, uh, I'm working on. And by thinking about these, it's improving my memorization of music. It's improving, it's helping me get past plateaus and it's making me realize, you know, there's some mu music that I've been practicing for years that I don't really know and that I could receive it and I could be knowledgeable and receive the knowledge uh, of that music. So <laughs> thinking about the Quavey sisters, how they weren't singers and yet they loved this thing. And it's like, I love this. I want to do this. Um, and not holding ourselves back and not being afraid of being terrible at something. Um, it's all tying together so beautifully. And I really appreciate this time to be together with Adam and Anastasia and Zach with you guys. Uh, it's been really inspiring in my own motion forward. And I'm going to remember these inspirations as I, uh, I, I want to do some guerrilla practicing right now. I was like, let's all grab our instruments and, and do some guerrilla practicing, you know, but thank you so much. This, I think, is um, my favorite Rewind episode that we've ever done. It's been a really special one. And all the clips that we chose, all eight of them seem to tie together really beautifully. And I think what kind of um, separates this episode from our earlier ones is the fact that in this one, we're taking a much more kind of like holistic view of like practicing music and really talking about stuff like joy, whether you're terrible or not, and um, kind of just how music makes you feel and how it fits into your life. And I think that's been really cool. Um, my main two takeaways <laughs> from this Rewind episode and what everyone has shared is obviously it's okay to be terrible and uh, don't try too hard. No one, no one likes a try hard. Um, but no, uh, I think just keeping those two things in mind and almost not overthinking it and being able to turn your brain off even a little bit and just kind of let the music flow and let it happen and just play what feels good and do what feels good. I think, um, I think that's, yeah, I think that's a major takeaway from this episode for me. Thank you all so much. This has been, I, I, I agree. Anastasia, this has been so much fun and I was up late last night uh, kind of preparing for this and I couldn't sleep. And so I started reading a book again. I'm, I'm rereading Michael Hyatt's uh, your, your best year ever, which I've read before, but I don't think I read it with intention. So this time I was reading it and actually going through, it's on my iPad. So I I'm highlighting sections and I'm pulling quotes out that are cool and putting them in my, my Evernote file for later. That's something I just started doing. Like when I find a cool quote, I'm going to dump it into a doc because you can never have enough good inspirational quotes. And as we get ready for the new year, you know, everyone sets these new year's resolutions and then we all fail because that's what humans do. We fail and then we try harder and then we fail again and we keep failing, but it's okay as long as you get back up. And one of the things that Michael said that I wanted to share with you before we wrap up is the only people with no hope are those who live with no regrets. So that's pretty powerful to me. And, uh, just for me to keep moving forward and keep growing as a person and a musician. Well, that wraps it up for today. Thanks again to the team for joining me as we reflected back on the last year of the show. We hope that you continue to join us into 2020 as we have quite a lineup ready for you. It's going to be another incredible year. As always, please drop us a line at hello at musicalitynow.com if you have any suggestions or feedback on the show. We'll see you soon, ready for new challenges, opportunities, and musical adventures. Until then, Happy New Year from all of us at Musical U. Oh, hey, one more thing. If you enjoyed this video, please take a second to like it on YouTube. And if you haven't already, please also subscribe to our channel there. That's going to help make sure you get all our latest videos as soon as they come out. And it also helps us reach more people, which means more episodes, better guests, and everybody wins. So please take a second to like this video and hit subscribe.